let's give you an idea of just how deep a tattoo needle goes into the skin during a tattoo. So we're not actually hitting the skin here with that needle and it's just barely coming out of the tube, but you can kind of tell if it was going through there, it wouldn't be going very deep at all. It would be going nowhere near the muscle or connective tissue underneath. It's just gonna be hanging out in the epidermis and the dermis. And look, we have Reno here from Saniderm helping out. Hey, Reno, what do you guys do again? Hey, we heal tattoos. Come check us out at Saniderm. These are four examples of kidney stones. You see those three on the left? Those had to be surgically removed because they're absolutely gigantic. And then you see that one on the right? That one was actually passed through the ureter. Now, the shape, the color, the size, all of that has to do with the exact mineral that forms the kidney stone. But I want to show you what it looks like next to an actual ureter. So if we look at this one, you can see why that had to be surgically removed. There's just no way it's gonna fit. But if I take this smaller one, and still, I mean look, that's still pretty big, but it's gonna have a much easier time fitting through that ureter than one of these ones that had to be surgically removed. This area right here commonly breaks during hip fractures. This is called the femoral neck, and it belongs to a larger bone called the femur. And this bone really is gigantic. It's the biggest in the body. But this thins out as it gets up towards the actual hip region. And this thinning makes it susceptible to breaking in certain populations, such as the elderly. If this has osteoporosis, it can't handle the stress, and it can just fracture creating or potentially creating a devastating injury. In between your ribs, you have muscles called the intercostals. And if you look closely, you can see these muscles are crisscrossing in their fiber orientation, right? They're just going back and forth. And depending on the direction, it will either elevate or depress the ribs, which will have an effect on whether you're breathing in or if you're breathing out. Let's talk about how fascia creates muscle compartments. So you're looking at the biceps brachii muscle and you see this white film. Those are collagen fibers that are bundled together in a tissue called fascia. Now watch as I move this back and forth. You can see the fibers are getting nice and tight and that's because they're resisting my push. They're also starting to blend with the adipose that's right next to it. You see fascia creates muscle compartments to make those muscles completely separate from the surrounding tissue. A lot of people ask us how we preserve these cadaver specimens. And the way we do that here in our lab is with this. This is called phenoxyethanol. And obviously this is just a water bottle, a spray bottle. And this is mainly water, but what's inside is what's called phenoxyethanol. It's a type of alcohol. And what we'll do is I will just grab this and spray the cadaver specimens down. And this is, I know this sounds crazy, but that's all I really have to do in order for them to stay as fresh as possible so we can teach with them for as long as possible. So this is kind of crazy, but your sternum used to be multiple bones. It really is multiple bones. You see this top portion? This is called the manubrium, and this is called the body, and then there's a little piece of cartilage down here called the xiphoid process. But this body used to be four separate bones. And what happens is it fully fuses about around the age of 25. So if you're under the age of 25, you might have an extra joint right here in your sternum. It's interesting though because cats, this sternum doesn't fully fuse, which makes it so they can bend a little bit more as they're running. C-section babies are babies that are born through the abdomen and they have a completely different microbiome than infants born vaginally. See, the microbiome is all the good bacteria that live on your skin and in your digestive tract. So, when the infants are born, they go through all this tissue, like muscle and fat, and then, oh, look at this, we can even see the uterus down here. Now, this is obviously pretty small. Picture this thing much, much bigger, and then the doctors are gonna cut through it and birth the child. And as they do that, the infant is going to interact with mom's skin. And on mom's skin is a bunch of good bacteria that will then start to populate the, the infant's skin, and it's even its digestive tract. Had it been born vaginally, mom's vaginal secretions would have done that. And we're finding that that may have interesting impacts later on in life. Now we went ahead and filmed an entire video all about C-sections. So if you're interested, go ahead and swipe over to our profile and check out our YouTube page. Let's take a look at this really dense, thick, white piece of connective tissue in your low back called the thoracolumbar fascia. You see, that's what you're looking at here. This is the low back. We can see the latissimus dorsi, or what most people would refer to as the lats, on this side, but we've removed the latissimus on this side, and that allowed us to see the deeper musculature of the back. But this white piece of tissue here is just a bunch of collagen fibers 
that the latissimus muscle and several other muscles are going to emerge out of, and it's just hanging out in your low back. Let's talk about scoliosis. We're looking at a real human skeleton, and if we look down its spine or its vertebral column, you'll notice that it's more or less going straight up and down. This individual did not have scoliosis. See, scoliosis is when that vertebral column is bending to the side in the lateral direction. You see, everyone's back does some bending, and if we look at this from this view, we can see that low back there is curving forward, then it's gonna start curving backwards, and then it curves forwards again in the neck. But that's normal. In scoliosis, we can get one bend, or you can even some, in really severe cases, get multiple bends in like an S-shaped curve. And in those most severe cases, they'll even install rods down the back to prevent it from getting any worse. So you're looking at the back of a human cadaver and we can see the scapula, or what most people would refer to as the shoulder blade. And up here is a muscle called the levator scapulae muscle. And just like its name suggests, it's going to elevate. What it elevates is this scapula. It's going to bring it upwardly like this. So if we kind of zoom out, you can see it just kind of going up. And so it's elevating the scapula as in a shoulder shrug. The other day we got a question from the user littlered179 to talk about the tendons of the ankle because they're gonna be getting surgery in this area. So there's a lot of tendons. So first off, I wanted to show you the difference between tendon, which is the white stuff, and muscle tissue, which is this redder stuff. Tendons are just gonna be collagen proteins that help to move the joint when the muscle contracts. So right here, we can see the tendons of what's called flexor digitorum longus and tibialis posterior. Those are gonna be behind the tibia. This one right here is the biggest tendon in the human body called the Achilles tendon, where your calf muscles attach to. And if I flip this to the front side, we can see the tendon of tibialis anterior, as well as the tendons of extensor digitorum longus as it's blending with the tendon of fibularis tertius. And then on this side right here, we can see the tendons of fibularis longus and fibularis brevis. So yeah, there are a lot of tendons in this ankle region. Your arm is barely attached to your body. This entire limb is only attached by a joint right here where your clavicle or your collarbone meets your sternum. You see, if you were to break your clavicle, the only thing keeping your entire arm attached to your body would be a few muscles. If you removed all the organs out of the body, you would be left with hollow spaces. And you're looking at one of those hollow spaces here because we went and removed one of the lungs. This is called the thoracic cavity. And look, I can stick my entire hand inside of there. This right here is your trachea or your windpipe. And you can see all the cartilaginous aspects of it. But if I turn it over like this, you can see where we've cut it open so you can see inside. Now normally, the inside would be lined with all these little projections called cilia that would pulsate and it would push mucus that developed inside of the lungs out and up into your throat. I wanna show you guys a really interesting birth defect. So we're looking at the glutes and I'm gonna kinda of push that to the side and what we see here are these two strands coming down. This is the sciatic nerve, except it's split. This is supposed to be one nerve. And it's not supposed to split like this until it gets to the back of the knee. But in this particular individual, if you look, this is one muscle right here. It almost looks like there's a little tiny muscle there and another one over here. That's the same muscle. What happened is the nerve punctured and it went right through the muscle when it wasn't supposed to. That is a birth defect and it was something that we just weren't expecting to find. If you've ever heard of someone say, ah, I'm bulging a disc, or I slipped a disc, or I herniated a disc, that's gonna be with this tissue here called an intervertebral disc. You see, this is a piece of cartilage that acts as a cushion between the two vertebrae. So it just kind of absorbs shock. Now normally, your vertebral column has ligaments that are surrounding it, preventing this piece of cartilage from moving forward or to the sides. But on the sides, we see there has to be an exit for spinal nerves. You see these holes here? These holes are called intervertebral foramen. And what happens is spinal nerves exit out of there. You see, if we come up here, you can see this metal rod. That would be like the spinal cord going all the way down the back. And then as it gets to the low back, it's gonna start branching off into spinal nerves. And it exits through those holes. And so the problem is those discs on occasion can slip and push into it, and we call that a slipped disc. 
Let's talk about cellulite. This is adipose in the gluteal region, and in cellulite, adipose starts to bulge upwardly in the superficial layers of the skin. And it does it in these discrete little pockets. So you get these raised areas and then these little valleys that are dipping down. And that starts to create this, what many people nickname, cottage cheese-like appearance. And that's what cellulite is. Now the interesting part is, it almost exclusively happens in females. It happens in the glutes, it happens in the thighs, it can even happen in the abdomen. But it seems like it's hormonally driven, but there's also environmental factors and even genetic factors. Let's talk about your cheekbones, because they're probably bigger than you were anticipating. You see this? This is called the zygoma bone, and it's connecting to the temporal bone via this little archway, and maybe I shouldn't say little, called the zygomatic arch. You see that little suture? That's where the zygoma is connecting to the temporal bone. But you have this archway in your cheek that several muscles are going to attach in or around. But yeah, it's kind of crazy to think that that's how big your cheekbone really is. Let's talk about your vocal cords. That's what this thing is right here, and it's inside of your larynx or your voice box. And if we look at it from a slightly different angle, you can see the opening between the two vocal cords that air would take as it travels down into your lower respiratory tract. So the vocal cords are going to open as you're breathing in and out, and they're also gonna be a little more open as you have a deeper tone, and a little more narrow as you have a higher tone. And they can even vibrate back and forth as you're singing and talking. Stomach grumbles are actually part of something called the migrating motor complex and what happens is your stomach starts to contract and then that will start to ripple its way through and it then moves through your entire intestinal tract. And the idea is it's trying to move leftover digestive material out of the way to make room for new digestive material that you're going to be eating. The thing is it also alerts you to, hey, we're ready for you to eat food and fill us up. This bone right here is called your scapula. Most people refer to it as the shoulder blade, but if we look at it from this view, it is extremely thin. Now, it's just gonna be resting on your rib cage, surrounded and embedded with muscle tissue, and as your shoulder moves up and down into the sides, this thing is just gonna be gliding around on the rib cage. You see these two muscles right here? This is called rhomboidius minor, and this one's called rhomboidius major. And these are gonna be deep to the muscle trapezius, which we've removed, but would be sitting just on the top of the back here. Now these muscles are gonna help bring this scapula in towards your back, so in towards the midline. Now what's interesting is these muscles experience a lot of tension in the back. So if you've ever been like just rounding your body forward, kinda like you're sitting in a car or sitting at a desk, these muscles are gonna be stretched to their maximum and they're gonna be feeling a ton of tension. You have false ribs. You see, the ribs that are considered to be true directly connect to the sternum. The ones that blend with the cartilage of the rib above it are considered false ribs. And then, down here we can see ribs 11 and 12 don't even connect up here to the sternum at all, which is why we call them floating ribs. I want to show you guys something really cool. You're looking at a right lung here. If I turn it around, we can see impressions from where the ribs pushed into the lung tissue as the lungs expanded during breathing. This is likely present on yours and everyone else's lungs that you know. If you were to stick your toes into a small space, let's say like a dance shoe or high heels, or maybe you just have bad posture, what you can get is something called a bunion. See, this is your big toe, and if I push it in that lateral or side direction, you can see that this starts to poke out. Now, if you picture a shoe on this side, this would be pressing, well, there's really skin and soft tissue on top of this, but that soft tissue would be pushing against the shoe. And obviously, that's not good. So it starts to get red and inflamed, and you can even, in some cases, get extra bone growth. And then look on this side. This part is being compressed, so we have space forming on this side and compression on this side. And that can cause grinding and wearing away of cartilage. So bunions are gonna get red and inflamed and be extremely painful. You hear a lot about the lungs these days with COVID-19 and everything that's going on with that, so I wanted to give a really good close-up look of lung tissue. So that's what this is, and you can see how squishy and soft this is gonna be. All this black stuff, that's not lung cancer or anything like that, those are blood vessels. So it's completely normal. And then I can even move the lung like this and open it up. I didn't make this cut. This is a fissure. This is, separates the different lobes of the lung. See, the lungs are divided into separate lobes.
but lung tissue is meant to expand and recoil and is very, very important, obviously, because without it, you wouldn't be able to breathe. This thing right here is responsible for gleeking. You know when people projectiles shoot saliva out their mouths? Well, what's happening is they're contracting muscles and squishing this gland, and you can see these little tiny ducts here. And what those are gonna do is empty into the mouth. That's what would be right here. And if you do it forcefully enough, you can literally spray saliva out the mouth. Let's talk about a real nasty bone break called the Jones Fracture. So if you look down here, this is at the, we follow the pinky toe all the way down this long bone here. This is called the fifth metatarsal. You're going to see this projection coming outwardly. Now obviously that spring is not supposed to be there. That's just so the bones can be held together. But this projection coming out here, if that snaps, and typically it'll snap just along this area right there, we call that a Jones Fracture and most likely you're gonna to have to be put in some kind of boot or cast. Sometimes it even requires surgery. This one is a real nagging type of injury that athletes get, and it can, it can cripple and ruin careers. Now what typically happens to cause it is they land on their foot on the side like that, and so then the bone just snaps.